Hello, everyone, and welcome to our live stream. I'm Manar Adli. I'm the founder and director of Mint Press News. We really appreciate you all joining us today. We have a very special guest and a very important topic to be discussing today. Um, if you could, just to help us beat uh, social media algorithms, we ask that you like and share this live stream and that you hit the subscribe button if you have not already. So we're just going to get right to it. Um, today, I'm joined by independent uh, journalist Michael Tracy to talk about Poland's secret role in Ukraine. His reporting on his Substack has exposed a media blackout about Poland's covert war inside of Ukraine and how the U.S. military buildup in Poland is the largest that we've ever seen since World War II. So when talking about Russia's war in Ukraine, uh, the media has shown us one side of the story which has unfolded, which is that there's a massive refugee crisis. Already, nearly 4.3 million people have fled out of Ukraine, mostly to neighboring Poland. But fewer people actually know that another group is also flooding uh, into Poland, which are U.S. soldiers by the thousands. So Washington has deployed thousands of extra troops to the country. And so Michael Tracy is here to join us today to discuss what exactly they're doing there and give us more background information about his recent trip to Poland. So thank you so much, Michael, for joining us. Yeah, it's nice to be with you. Let me just add you here to the screen. Oops. Ah. So thank you. There you are. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I want to begin by talking about this massive troop buildup inside of Poland. Um, you've written that it's the largest U.S. military buildup inside of Poland since World War II. And I feel like that's the story that uh, hasn't been talked about when it comes to Poland. And so could you give us a brief explanation about uh, this military buildup and what we need to know about it? Yeah, well, there are a couple of different dimensions to it. The U.S. troop deployment to Poland now is at the highest levels, as you mentioned, uh, that it has been in decades. And as far as I could gather, certain units are doing different things throughout Poland. Um, so on the one hand, if you go to Krakow right now, which is more in the southwestern portion of the country, you're liable to see small groups of U.S. soldiers just kind of casually traipsing around the city where they're just, you know, basically doing tourist activities. I would happen across them and like they're taking selfies of one another or eating at restaurants, not doing anything that seemed particularly serious. Um, but, you know, in talking to them, what I was told is that their mission, at least in this part of the country, is just to be visible, just mm -hmm. simply to be physically present. Because the idea is that they're supposed to be giving, quote unquote, reassurance to the Polish population and the Polish government that the U.S. military is active in the country and is going to come to their defense in the event of some sort of further Russian incursion, which a lot of Poles do actually think is a genuine possibility. And I, I don't want to too flippantly discount those fears as sheer paranoia, because it's true that Poland was controlled by the Soviet Union for a very long time, and people have uh, acute memories of that. Still, that being said, in the lead up to the Ukraine war, Putin did, and other Russian government officials did, pretty manifestly lay out a very elaborate rationale for why Ukraine in particular was viewed as a legitimate target. Putin put out that whole manifesto last summer explaining the sort of logic behind the historical connection between Ukraine and Russia as he saw it, whereas nothing really comparable has been produced yet vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Poland, and yet you still see this very pervasive anxiety about somehow Poland potentially being next. Um, so part of the reason for this U.S. troop deployment is, I guess, just this psych to put them at psychic ease. Um, and it also should be acknowledged that a lot of Polish people do appreciate the presence of U.S. troops. Um, they said, I th uh, one way that a soldier described it to me is that pretty much nine out of every 10 Poles that they encounter will have a positive reaction to them being there, although on occasion that one person out of 10 will confront them and argue with them and 
kind of lambast them for U.S. foreign policy or something. But, you know, by and large, it's a positive reception that they're receiving. So that's what's happening in, in parts of the country where U.S. Uh, the U.S. troops are deployed as part of a um, bilateral arrangement with between with the Polish government. So you have the NATO deployment and also the U.S. Poland bilateral deployment. So that's happening throughout the country. But then when, once you go toward the Ukraine border in the southeastern portion of the country, that's where the secrecy reigns more supreme and you can't really get access to the soldiers and they're not they're not as accessible as they are elsewhere in the country. Right. Um, so you, one way that this new outpost was described to me that the U.S. has now erected in this town called uh, Zheshev, where actually Biden visited a few like uh, maybe two weeks ago. When was that? And uh, seemed to allude to U.S. troops eventually entering into Ukraine itself so they could see the bravery of Ukrainian people confronting tanks or something. Apparently, we're told this was not an actual indication that Biden was going to be deploying U.S. troops to Ukraine. But then again, who the heck knows what he's even talking about half the time? Or what, Well, he made a gaffe, didn't he, when he met with them, saying that they're going to be in Ukraine soon? Well, yeah, that's what, yeah, that's what I'm referring to. And, yeah. you know... I, I'm a little bit reticent to just accept at face value this whole notion that he's committing these endless series of gaffes uh, because the classic definition of a gaffe is when a politician inadvertently reveals the truth. Um, and so, you know, it wouldn't be outside the realm of possibility that the U.S. could right. deploy these advisors so-called into Ukraine or maybe that, that they're even there right now. I mean, who you know, there's a whole fog of war that it, it's impossible to really sift through with any degree of precision at the moment, despite the credulity right. of the media, just taking everything on uh, on uh, on the surface. Um, but anyway, you know, so so Biden visited this outpost, right, in, in Jeshev, and it's basically what's happened over the past couple of months is that the U.S. has set up essentially the equivalent of Ramstein 2.0, and Ramstein is this huge air base in Germany that the U.S. has commanded for decades ever since you know world war ii really and they're they're setting up sort of a, a a new version of that in poland within approximately you know 60 miles of the border and this is where all the nato and u.s weapons shipments are being flown into or many of them anyway and then they're taken on these aid con so-called aid convoys into poland and i went to this airport that has now been converted into this sort of makeshift U.S. base. And you, you go and you see these nondescript trucks. They appear to be Polish trucks, but no one will explain anything about them to you if you ask. They appear to be Polish trucks, and it's unclear who's even driving the trucks. You know, I try to ask and, you know, be shooed off or um, not be told really anything about who's actually facilitating the delivery of these weapon shipments that the U.S. constantly touts that they're orchestrating, right? Um, but we you know, notwithstanding that secrecy, you can see them physically gathering at this airport and supposedly it's Ukrainians, we're told, uh, who are driving phys physically the convoys, the truck convoys into the country. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's impossible to say with any degree of specificity, given the layer of secrecy that they're imposing. And right. I actually went to a couple of bases, all, not just that one in Jesha, but also in this place called Milek, which is somewhat nearby. And I, I went and just asked basically the most basic question that you could ask as a journalist at one of these facilities, which is that are, I asked the soldier, are you granting any press access whatsoever? And he and he consulted with his colleague. They went and go to talk to what's called the PIO or the public information officer who's in, theoretically in charge of media engagements. And I was told by multiple soldiers independently of one another that the policy in place at these new U.S. installations throughout Poland is a media blackout. So even the most friendly and deferential journalists who they could hand pick to present in a positive light what the US military is doing there. Even they are not being permitted to enter these facilities. Um, so it makes you wonder because every couple of days we get another so-called gaffe from Biden where he appears to be revealing another layer of involvement of the US in this 
Ukraine conflict, right? So last week, Biden, you know, seemingly slipped up and admitted that the U.S. is training Ukraine soldiers, but then we're told it's not happening in Poland. It's just maybe just happening in the U.S. Uh, you know, tons of ambiguity here, uh, and it leads one to question why it is that even the most, you know, <laughs> obsequious journalists who otherwise would be falling over themselves to paint in a flattering light this U.S. troop deployment because they deeply are, are emotionally invested and ideologically invested in the U.S. cause here vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, why even they are not even uh, are being barred from any uh, press access. So this is a U.S. military intervention. It's the U.S. It, this is the hub of the U.S. waging a enormous proxy war. It's the largest weapons funneling operation that the U.S. has ever undertaken in Europe since World War II uh, by a lot. And, you know, a lot of the, the, the mechanics of it and the logistics of it are still shrouded in secrecy. And because most U.S. journalists unabashedly support this intervention, they also un unabashedly support the secrecy. So they're hardly doing much investigation at all. Every now and then, in fairness, you will see an article from like the Wall Street Journal news reporters or something where they kind of pr uh, provide a few tidbits about these operations. But uh, by and large, the media is very hostile to any real coverage of this. And they think that the only permissible reporting on the conflict is to do what, you know, every NBC news anchor and Sky News anchor are doing, which is go to Lviv in western Ukraine, somewhat near to the Polish border, and just repeat the day's talking points that have been provided to you by right. Ukraine government officials. And supposedly you're doing this intrepid war reporting because you're on uh, you're, you, you have the landscape of Lviv in the background where no fighting really is happening except for the occasional airstrike on the outskirts. Uh, but, you know, you're, you're brave and worthy of commendation for that. And, no, and they don't think that it's, it's acceptable or uh, desirable to report really on the nature of the U.S. military intervention, despite its escalate, escalatory nature, where like every couple of days there's a new, again, way in which it seems to be escalating. Just this past week, um, it was announced that apparently uh, the U.S. is facilitating the transfer of tanks into Ukraine, right? So it went from, you know, just you know, small, small arms and then, you know, to, then to Javelin missiles and then the Stinger missiles. And then there was this whole kerfuffle over whether they would be transferring in fighter jets. And that was apparently scuttled by Biden because it would be too escalatory. But now, lo and behold... Sending in tanks is not escalatory. I mean, it doesn't really make any sense. And the, the U.S. public doesn't have a whole lot of real insight into how this is transpiring, in part because the, the media is just so fervently credulous, as it often tends to be. Absolutely. The fog of war uh, disrupts you know, reality. It, it completely fogs people's ability to uh, think critically and ask questions. And, you know, we at Mint Press did this really incredible study uh, by Alan McLeod that showed that over 90% of the uh, analysis and op-eds in the Washington Post, in the New York Times, and I believe it was the Wall Street Journal, uh, were written by uh, columnists and analysts that were directly funded by NATO. Um, and so, or, you know, other or weapons manufacturers like Lockheed Martin or Raytheon. Um, and so it's it's no secret that our corporate mainstream media acts as the apparatus, um, you know, mouthpiece for the war machine, for weapons manufacturers to push their interests. And so what's really unfortunate with the fog of war is that, you know, people, when they're turning to the media to try to understand what's happening, they don't even realize that what they're consuming is straight up propaganda. And that's why there's such a strong push by social media tech giants, which are also working with the intelligence community, with the deep state, with weapons manufacturers and, and uh, the political elite to control the narrative. And that's why there's such a huge censorship campaign taking place right now, um, as we see on Twitter and on other platforms. And so that's why it's so important that people follow the work of, you know, you, Michael, um, on your Substack and follow, you know, organizations like Mint Press Independent Media. Um, you know, you talk about uh, Ukraine being the, you know, the largest, uh, uh, the United States funneling the largest um, 
amount of weapons to Ukraine, and we don't even know where these weapons are going. I mean, it's almost like we're seeing the Syria playbook just completely play out uh, all over again. I mean, when you describe that those trucks were driving through with weapons, and we don't even know really what weapons are inside or who who these drivers are, all I could think of is when we were on the ground in Syria, and we would see this, these same uh, images play out there, and we saw... <laughs> you know, how the United States with the CIA and intelligence groups and other uh, countries, um, you know, a lot of them NATO allied countries with the UK, France, Saudi Arabia, Israel, you know, pump this country uh, with weapons uh, to create a civil war. And so I want you to talk to us a little bit more about the weapons that are going in and what we do know about who these weapons, you know, where these weapons are landing, like who are, um, who are using these weapons? Where are the weapons ending up? Well, again, it's being deliberately yeah. obscured. So you got to wonder why. Yeah. The New York Times did report recently that the CIA is supposedly vetting yeah. <laughs> where these sh weapons shipments are being delivered to. So, you know, I'm sure they're doing a scrupulous evaluation of the Ukrainian army units that are now... The glorious recipients of stinger missiles and who knows, even tanks apparently. Um, and, you know, there's this whole fog of, of war around it that is, it's not just like a natural manifestation of, you know, the, the forces of the universe. I mean, it's being deliberately imposed and possibly because the U.S. government does not want the public to have a full picture of what it is that taxpayers are funding because they might not like it, particularly if it's akin to how we know Syria unfolded. Um, just as a quick sort of aside, because you were mentioning this proliferation of so-called experts in the media who are funded by these military uh, industrial interests, uh, you know, I, I have one paradigmatic example of that just because I happened to engage with this person recently, but it's a really funny one. And this, there's this woman named Olga Lautman, who I would never have even really heard of, but, you know, of course, out of nowhere, um, accused by her a few days ago of being a, quote, shill for Putin's genocide, as if I'm running around making affirmative defenses for some sort of genocidal policy, which, of course, is absurd. But this is what she calls me. And so, you know, two seconds of research reveals that this woman is directly funded by way of her affiliation with this, you know, ambiguously acronym think tank called SEPA, Center for European Policy Analysis, based in D.C. This woman is funded through her think tank by who else? But, you know, not just Lockheed Martin, which is kind of a, a, a right. typical one, not just Microsoft and Google, which are typical ones, not just these foundations like, you know, Craig Newmark philanthropies and so on and so forth, but actually funded by the U.S. European Command, which is the command of the U.S. military in Europe. I mean, so yeah. she's actually subsidized directly by the U.S. military, and yet she has the gumption to be rattling off these accusations that other people are shills. So it's interesting because I'm sure you've maybe seen this yourself. Notwithstanding that I am largely just funded by people who voluntarily pay to subscribe to a Substack or something, right? That I'm a shill for, for, for receiving, you know, a modest amount of income in that fashion. But the people who are actually funded by the most powerful governments and corporations and so-called phil philanthropic foundations in the, in the world – they're not never shills, right? They're just pure hearted purveyors of truth or something. Um, so that's sort of an interesting dynamic that seems to recur quite frequently. Uh, but as far as the, the, the weapon shipments go back on, on that point, yeah. um, you know, it, I, I would on occasion go to the actual Ukrainian border. So I didn't go into Ukraine itself, but I could see the territory of Ukraine from the Polish side. And you just sit there for a while, or I would anyway, and watch the cars going in. And there are a lot of giant trucks and even some seemingly civilian vehicles that purported to be humanitarian aid convoys. So they would even have humanitarian right. kind of blazing on the side, or they would have like the, you know, the Red Cross symbol or something to that effect. And 
weirdly, whenever you'd ask one of these people, you know, who are you affiliate? Not always, but sometimes when you try to ask these people who they're affiliated with, like, where are they headed? How, how have they arranged this process whereby they're entering into a war zone to deliver humanitarian aid? Do they have any backing maybe from a foreign government or whatever? It would be very difficult to get any candor, right? So it's very much appears to me the, to be the case that a, a, a fair percentage of this so-called humanitarian aid is really just a cover to facilitate maybe semi-official arms shipments. Because one thing that you see that apparently all these tech companies now allow, including Twitter, uh, PayPal, Venmo, is overt crowdfunding for what are essentially arms trafficking projects under the guise of charity. Like you'll see on, on Twitter, people posting links to a so-called charity that was recently established around the onset of the war. And they'll be saying that they're sending, you know, much needed ammunition to frontline Ukrainian military soldiers. And they're, you know, welcoming people to uh, send money to this cause. And it's an arms trafficking initiative. And that's what right. it is. Well, um, we, and we can't forget that USAID headed by Samantha Powers was responsible for uh, funneling weapons, you know, to many countries like in Syria. And so it's no, yeah, yeah. no secret the, that these, you know, aid agencies can be a front um, in sending weapons to these countries. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. I and mean, so, I mean, you have that official aspect of it, meaning whether it's through USAID or yeah. some other entity within the U.S. federal government, which has now this really active hub that it can facilitate and coordinate these transfers from in Poland, uh, or, you know, maybe some like semi like private enterprises where these kind of profiteers now are taking it upon themselves to transfer aid because they've crowdfunded or they're getting private donations. You know, when I was in this place, uh, Yeshev, I would just be kind of at these even you know, public places where Americans were gathering. And I had a one really <laughs> enlightening encounter, which is that I you know, overheard this American very bla loudly blabbing on the phone, right? And as a journalist, you always love to overhear salacious conversations like that, that aloof people who maybe be up to no good are having. Um, I was just listening to him and he was bragging about how he supposedly had a direct line to the Ukraine generals, military general staff, that he was somehow arranging uh, air cargo shipments from Canada, that he, you know, was contemplating how involved to get his friends in this, this special forces pro professional organization with his uh, initiative. And so I, I go over and, and talk to him and Number one, he evinces a very robust familiarity with the nature of the Department of Defense's procurement process. So basically how weapons contractors execute their contracts and uh, get these um, weapons produced. So he was curiously familiar with that and also knew a whole lot about the supply lines going in and out of Ukraine from Poland. Uh, but he told me that ultimately what he was doing was just aid. He was just a humanitarian aid worker, and yet he wouldn't reveal a single detail about himself or whatever organization he was affiliated with because it could compromise some sort of security. I don't, maybe this guy was totally full of crap. I don't think so. I don't think he had any reason to lie about me. And I'm not really reporting anything that he said as established fact because, again, it was just a conversation I overheard and I tried to verify it journalistically by requesting the interview him, and he turned it down. Um, but you, you see all these profiteers and spook-like thinkers now flooding into this part of southeastern Poland because it's a hugely lucrative enterprise. I mean, there's a ton of aid, so-called money, flowing into this area. And uh, we see every couple of days, Biden announces another tranche of you know $600 million or something worth of uh, military aid. And somebody's got to be paid to actually execute the facilitation of that aid, right? And it tends to be done by some of the shadiest characters on earth, as uh, you're, you're probably aware of from the example of Syria. Of course. And, you know, I want to talk about these, these accusations of genocide, because right now there's calls to bring Putin and Russia to the International Criminal Court uh, over genocide accusations um, over what's happening in, and I think it's called Marupol and in 
Bucha, the Murpal Hospital yeah. in Bucha, uh, massacres that, you know, alleged massacres that, that took place. And the media is really pushing uh, the term genocide very hard when it comes to what's happening in Ukraine, which is really ironic because we have some real time genocides that have, are taking place today, like in, in Yemen, where uh, a U.S. Saudi led uh, coalition has imposed a blockade and which has resulted in 23 million people starving right now. They don't have access to food. And even when they even when Saudi Arabia was sitting on a key human rights council, they weaponized human human. Uh, humanitarian aid and food aid they actually blocked it from entering the country and while they were sitting on this uh, human rights council uh saudi arabia was dropping bombs on yemenis targeting children at you know in school buses uh water facilities i mean we have a real-time genocide that's being backed you know armed i was just gonna say dropping bombs made by u.s weapons manufacturers exactly. has, has been independently corroborated many times by people who actually look at the the um shrapnel and look at the remnants of these weapons and you know, ascertain that they were produced in you know alabama or something exactly and because the united states uh you know invasion hague invasion act the united states cannot be taken to the hague and if they are taken to the hague they've threatened basically to invade the hague and so we have a lot of hypocrisy taking place within the media and i just want to show some headlines um showing uh these accusations of genocide. So I'm going to share them right now. One moment, please. So we have this first headline, pure genocide, civilians targeted, you know, civilian targets in Maripil annihilated by Russian attacks. And this story is really interesting because it went viral um, and it became basically became, uh, you know, this, uh, the reason, the evidence, I guess you could say, for pushing for more weapons to get into Ukraine, for the United States to push for more weapons shipments into Ukraine, ironically, as if weapons going into a country solve an already, you know, very sad and hard situation. Can I just quickly comment on this before you yes. move on to this example? Luke Harding, this is hilarious. Luke Harding, yeah, this is the, author. the author of this article, was one of the absolute most discredited fabulists who reported on the so-called Russiagate saga within the U.S. from roughly 2016 to 2020, the most quintessential example of which was an article that I still think is on the Guardian website uncorrected and has never been substantiated, that Harding claims proved that Paul Manafort, who is this campaign chairman for the Trump campaign, had met with Assange, Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy in London during the 2016 election where they colluded and, you know, figured out how to do Russia's bidding to install Trump into power. Um, and, you know, we all are supposed to be extremely fearful and concerned about this scourge of so-called disinformation, right? But this article was basically revealed to be total nonsense. And Luke Harding was the perpetrator of it and now apparently he's running around as a war correspondent to yeah. let every let the world know that uh, genocide is underway as if his journalistic bona fides have been established and actually i think you know this is sort of a tangent but just very briefly i think russiagate was pretty critical in setting the stage discursively for what we're seeing now in terms of the fervor no that doubt americans no feel doubt. and the media feels about this war in ukraine right because they are especially liberals viewed Russia as this global menace that was pulling the strings all over the world to f fund and fuel and foment these like dangerous right-wing insurrectionist movements, including in the personage of Donald Trump, who it was alleged that they actually installed into power as a sort of Manchurian candidate style scheme in 2016. And so like the ideological dimensions were in place by way of Russiagate to then sort of enable this launching of a major war fervor at the at the moment that Russia you know does something militarily in uh, you know on the other side of the world, and so Harding was actually integral in priming the U.S. and to some extent U.K. publics to have this really committed and aggressive response to what the so-called West ought to be doing to to defeat Russia. And uh, that's why you see so, so I think it's a big reason why you see so little pushback 
especially amongst liberals now, for stuff like Biden publicly Calling demanding for regime yeah, change. Uh, for, for I mean, and it's and you know before that it was you know Blinken, the Secretary of State, admitted that the purpose of sanctions. U.S. sanctions on Russia was not merely to punish Putin or Russian government officials. It was to inflict suffering on Russian civilians such that they would then, you know, be sent into such privation that maybe at some point the government could be overthrown. Um, you, that, the that's what, there's so much dehumanization of Russian people now. Uh, and it was primed and prepared for the last, you know, seven years with Russiagate and the Trump administration. There's no question about that. And like you said, we have, you know, U.S. government officials like Nancy Pelosi, the president himself, and Tony Blinken, uh, very overtly saying that, you know, the agenda of these um, sanctions is to inflict suffering on the Russian people. I mean, they're saying uh, the secret part out loud now, whereas liberals, you know, maybe even just five years ago would have never said that. The liberal establishment would have hidden that fact and said that yeah. it's just supposed to hurt you know, maybe affect like one government official or something like that. Well, I wrote a Substack a couple of weeks ago where I yeah. quoted from the uh, 2015 National Security Strategy document that had been put out by the Obama administration, where Joe Biden was the vice president. And they laid out what their supposed rationale was regarding sanctions, you know, whether it was with respect to Iran or Venezuela or Cuba or what have you. And they said that the purpose of sanctions would be limited. I mean, the, they would explicitly limited to narrowly punishing government officials and would be tailored to not inflict any punishment on civilians as though they're as though it's this act of collective punishment where we're attributing blame to ordinary people for the actions of their uh, government. Right. Um, so that was at least the pretense. Now, it wasn't in practice what sanctions actually did. They did inflict collective punishment as a matter Absolutely. of economic warfare. But there used to at least be this conceit, especially among yeah. liberals and Democrats, that that wasn't the purpose, right? But now they're just overt about it. Overt. They admit that it's the purpose and they are proud to declare that it's the purpose. And of course, Republicans are all on board with this as well because they don't care. Um, they, and they have their own like quasi Cold War logic now that's been resurrected where you know you have Tom Cotton, for example, Speaking at the Reagan uh, Library a few weeks ago, and uh, where you know, Zelensky was awarded this Reagan Freedom Medal, as though he were inducted to this pantheon of like uh, into this pantheon of Reagan mythology, alongside Margaret Thatcher and uh, George H. W. Bush and all these people. And uh, the point of Cotton's speech was that he was trying to fuse together the the MAGA sensibility, which was supposedly more skeptical of interventionism, more nationalistic, more so-called realist, uh, with the more quintessentially neocon foreign policy as best represented by George W. Bush's administration, which is you know, classically you know, uh, invested in spreading democracy by military force everywhere in the world. Co Cotton insists that these two sensibilities can be fused together and one way to do that is to demand more and more aggressive escalatory actions against Russia. So, that, so to the extent that Republicans have any criticism of Biden right now, it's that they're denouncing him for not being aggressive enough, even right. though he's calling for publicly for regime change. He's alluding to troop deployments of, you know, so-called boots on the ground into Ukraine. He's now sending tanks as of just this week. Uh, but that's not enough for Republicans. I mean, they, uh, they think that it should go. Further, and they, you know, they had this whole thing where they were criticizing him for not going along with this Polish apparent proposal to send MiG fighter jets from Ukraine in uh, from uh, Poland rather into Ukraine. Um, you know, Poland actually is the most sort of bombastic maybe member of the European Union, or at least significant, you know, large larger member of the European Union in uh, demanding more and more confrontation with Russia vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine. And, uh, you know, at least if you look at sort of the uh, more surface level reporting, occasionally Biden appears to have scuttled some of these more uh, kind of far reaching potential initiatives, such as this jet transfer idea. Uh, and Republicans are outraged about this. I mean, they want just all restraint thrown out the window. And they think that, you know, now re regime change is the least of it in terms of what ought to be done. You even had Sean Hannity, for example, 
couple weeks ago saying, oh, why doesn't NATO just kind of sneak into Ukraine and bomb that uh, tank convoy, Russian tank convoy that had previously been encircling uh, Kiev? And then we'll, you know, maybe they'll, they, won't, they won't figure out that it's us, but we should just do that. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, there's this kind of uh, convergence of different ideological tendencies in the U.S., partly deriving from the frenzy around Russiagate amongst liberals, and then also now this ancestral, like anti-Soviet tendency among Republicans uh, that is now uh, kind of aligning to create this consensus around just an unwavering, unflinching devotion to a constantly escalating proxy war. And even if you use the word proxy war, I've discovered, you get denounced as some sort of Russian propagandist or, you know, these liberal propaganda organs like Media Matters have called me a quote unquote conservative journalist for using that term as though I got like a memo from the Republican National Committee to let me know what a proxy war consists of. I mean, I don't know what you're, what else you're supposed to call this weapons funneling initiative that the U.S. military is undertaking in a hot war zone. It seems to me like it's proxy warfare and it seems to me it's, it's like it's being muted. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, 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 the, yeah, the, the, uh, Leon Panetta, who is the Secretary of Defense and CIA Director in the Obama Biden administration, publicly went out early, uh, last month and said, "Yeah, this is proxy a proxy war ag by the U.S. against Russia, even if you currently serving U.S. officials don't want to admit it." Um, so yeah, I'm just using his terminology, but there's such there's such a uh, kind of a unbreakable consensus around this issue that even the, using proper terminology is regarded as some kind of a front. I want to share this video of uh, Biden talking about um, Putin. Yeah. And so I'm just going to share this really quick and play it. They stood for solidarity here. You can Poland. hear it, right? And together, it was an unmistakable, and undeniable force of the people that the Soviet Union could not withstand. And we're seeing it once again today with the brave Ukrainian people showing that their power of many is greater than the will of any one dictator. So in this hour, let the words of Pope John Paul burn as brightly today. Never, I'm never tearing give up. up hope. Never <laughs> doubt. Never tire, never become discouraged. Be not afraid. A dictator bent on rebuilding an empire will never erase a people's love for liberty. Brutality will never grind down their will to be free. Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia. For free people refused to live in a world of hopelessness and darkness. We will have a different future, a brighter future, rooted in democracy and principle, hope and light, of decency and dignity, of freedom and possibilities. For God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. God bless you all, and may God defend our freedom, and may God protect our troops. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. You want to sing the Star Spangled Banner together now? You know, we'll stand you know up and put our hands over our hearts. <laughs> you know what I was going to say is if we could just juxtapose um, George Bush ahead of the U.S. invasion of Iraq and all of the U.S. politicians right now in terms of like how he used to talk about um, how Bush talked about Saddam Hussein and how. Putin is being described. I mean, it's like no different. It's no different than what's happening right now. I mean, that's, and it just goes to show just how much war fervor there is now. I feel like this is the most war fervor I have seen uh, in my lifetime <laughs> since 9-11. You know? Well, yeah, I mean, actually, a lot of, there are U.S. politicians. I was just, I'm writing something else now, and I was looking up a quote from Chris Coons, who's the senator from Delaware, Democratic senator, who's a big confidant of Biden because they're both from Delaware, which is this, somewhat insignificant state, except for the fact that Biden's from there. Um, and uh, Chris Coons was quoted in the New York Times, and the New York Times has repeated this on other occasions, kind of reverently recounting how wonderful it is that there is such unity right now in the Congress 
unlike anything that has been seen since, as you put it, or as you alluded to, 9-11. I mean, that's what they're actually saying. And they love it. I mean, the New York Times is head over heels in kind of glorious adulation of this so-called unity, as though the post-9-11 period was like a, a land of milk and honey where there was just yeah, a great- a glorious time, yeah. Yeah, a, a, a great sequence of policy initiatives that were undertaken by the government that were very smart and very um, prudent. Um, so, you know, like the Patriot Act, you know, was a just a swell thing in hindsight yeah. and invasion of Iraq, you know, yeah, maybe it was underrated, actually, you know, thinking back, um, you know, and on and on and on. So th they actually think that the kind of so-called unity that bolstered that consensus in 2001 being replicated today is somehow conducive to good policy. Um, and yeah, and actually... The, and the war fervor that you mentioned was also exemplified by, by what the media did in the wake of that Biden call for regime change, which let's try to uh, step back and appreciate for a moment. I mean, that's a really kind of threshold crossing event for the U.S. president to go bef before a public stage and not just in some off the cuff quip. I mean, there are times when B Biden's having a just sort of casual seeming encounter with somebody and he'll say something that was that would be called a gaffe right but that was a formal speech at a podium in a deliberately sec selected foreign capital poland that would be most receptive any pretty much anywhere in europe to these kinds of calls for more antagonistic policy directed at russia right as i learned when i was there where you do see this undercurrent of, of paranoia uh, about the supposed nefarious designs of russia which again i don't fully discount but it is a there is a paranoid dimension to it um but anyway, Biden is at the climax of this soaring speech. That's one of the, the defining moments of his presidency. This was the most important foreign trip he had thus far taken to the first NATO summit, where actually I tried to get in in Brussels, but they wouldn't let me because of the Belgian Ministry of Defense, you know, I guess looked me up or something and said I wasn't permitted. Um, anyway, uh, so the, Biden goes from Brussels to Poland and he delivers this kind of this uh, manifesto type speech about what U.S. policy is going to be with regard to this generation defining conflict. And at the climax, at the most like dramatic peroration, he declares that this man cannot stay in office any longer. Putin. It's a call to regime change. And what does the U.S. media do, Jace, basically? In the immediate aftermath, they get emails from... Uh, anonymous White House officials. I mean, they just give out anonymity like uh, candy, these American media. They don't even bother justifying it. I mean, what basis would there be to give Jen Psaki or Jake Sullivan or whoever else is sending them these clarifying emails, anonymity, who knows? But anyway, they, they, they put out these like so-called walkback statements where it's claimed, oh, this wasn't a call for regime change. It was just who knows? Biden saying this in the midst of a formal speech in one of the biggest uh, platforms he's had so far as president was just a gaffe. I mean, please, there's no evidence that it was a gaffe. Biden, when asked if it was a gaffe, actually so-called doubled down in the aftermath. He didn't retract what he said. He just said there wasn't any change to U.S. policy, which you know what that reveals? It was just that Biden was overtly articulating what U.S. policy is geared toward, which could have been inferred prior to his statement in Warsaw, but has now been formally expressed, which is regime change. I mean, that's the point right. of the sanctions. That's the point of the U.S. seeming to just act, uh, flatly undercut any um, so-called peace negotiations. The U.S. is not even a party to the, any of these negotiations, apparently. And whenever there's an apparent development that could potentially be positive, they throw cold water on it. So the Pentagon and the State Department in unison will say, oh, you know, we don't believe that Russia is serious about anything. And it seems like their objective is not to assist in the facilitation of these peace talks, but to undermine them instead. Um, so that's the obvious policy posture of the U.S. government. Um, and, and you see now more and more reports, including some that I've heard from sources, that the supposed ideal scenario for the U.S. is not to cease hostilities in Ukraine, but to protract them for as long as possible. Actually, General Milley, 
the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, testifying before Congress this week, uh, uh, articulated a version of this where he's saying, look, this could go on for years, as though the U.S. has no power over whether it does or does not go on for years. Like, it's just this naturally occurring event that the war is going to go on for years. Like the U.S. isn't actually fueling it overtly. Um, yes. But they view it. But, but apparently that's viewed as within the interests of the U.S. government now to so-called bleed Putin dry and right. in hopes of engineering regime change, which is exactly what Biden said U.S. policy now is. But the media in its credulity and in its gullibility and just stupidity acts as this PR wing of the of the government where they're engaging in this information warfare thing where it's like good cop, bad cop. Oh, Biden makes a seemingly over aggressive statement, but then the good cop comes in and says, oh, it's not quite what he meant, but the message was delivered. So, you know, you, you call for regime change, but then slightly mitigate the intensity of the call. It doesn't really matter because, you know, Putin still heard that, right? And so did everybody else in the world. And it's this the, 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 basically what the U.S. media is doing is just acting as a willing prong of an information warfare campaign that the U.S. government explicitly says that it's waging. I mean, there was an, I don't know if you saw this earlier today, but there was an amazing clip. I'm going to share NBC it. Actually. Okay, yeah, please show that. Let's share it, okay? And I'm actually, I have your tweet pulled up. Okay. I was going to talk to you about this one, so one moment, please. Should I, I'll play it and then you can give us your feedback, Okay. Okay. So you're, well, I'll read your tweet. So you tweeted, NBC is now admi admits to being a willing and eager participant in what it acknowledges is an unprecedented campaign of information warfare waged by the U.S. government, even to the point of peddling straightforwardly fake information. Remember, this is considered serious journalism in the U.S. <laughs> I always like to throw in that little trademark symbol yeah. to, in my sarcasm. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's brilliant. Okay, so let's watch. With the U.S. using intelligence to fight an information war and doing it to Russia for months now, and it's working. NBC News national security correspondent Ken Delaney in live in Washington. Uh, Ken, I want to start uh, by giving people an example of what this is so they know what we're talking about. Take a look. They're also suggesting that Ukraine has biological and chemical weapons in Ukraine. That's a clear sign he's considering using both of those. Can, can you explain to our viewers what was going on there and what NBC News has learned about that claim this week from three different U.S. officials? Yeah, that was a great example of what we're talking about. That was based on declassified intelligence. But we're also told the intelligence wasn't very clear about what exactly was going on. And they decided to, to disclose it as a way of deterring uh, Russia from doing that and putting the world on notice that this could happen. And that's really, that's what's going on here, the big picture. This is an unprecedented use of declassified intelligence. We've never seen this level of information warfare before from the U.S. government. And what they're doing is they're trying to preempt the Russians, get ahead of Russian disinformation, even mess with Vladimir Putin's brain, as one person put it, uh, leave him off balance to sh try to show that the United States knows what Russia is up to and is going to get ahead of it. Um, it's it's really rather remarkable. Another example was when they announced that Russia had gone to China uh, to ask for help with, what, with getting some weapons. That hasn't come to pass yet, and it was almost a way of putting China on notice. Hey, we know what's going on here. Don't let this happen. So really interesting and yeah. unprecedented use of intelligence here, Alice. Yeah, and Ken, as you just said, not just intelligence here, unprecedented use. Use. One U.S. official telling you it doesn't even have to be solid intelligence when we talk about it. It's more important to get out ahead of them, Putin specifically, before they do something. It's preventative. Uh, what else have you learned about that strategy? So there we have it. And you know, what's so, <laughs> you know what's so funny is that if you look at the title here at the bottom, at the very bottom of this clip, it says how the U.S. is using intelligence to fight information war with Russia. I mean, this is... Uh, basically, they're they're admitting. I mean, it's ironic. They're kind of flipping it, but it's ironic that they're just blatantly admitting that uh, they are pushing propaganda, and it doesn't even have to be fact. No, I mean they're admitting that they're engaging in disinformation as yeah. a warfare tactic, which of course it was always obvious that they were doing, regardless of whether they publicly admitted it or not. But now it's just out in the open and no longer even 
has the pretension of being concealed. And it's sort of funny because as we speak, there's this conference going on at the University of Chicago that is run by uh, being run by The Atlantic, The Atlantic magazine, which is kind of this bastion of so-called you know, elite, respectable opinion. And Obama actually appeared at this conference yesterday. You had Ann Applebaum, all these kind of think tank funded disinformation experts regaling us with their wisdom and deep experience. And what they're basically saying in unison is that disinformation is this horrible problem that threatens democracy, right? Well, conveniently, they just got another amazing example of disinformation that they can comment on. It just happens to be emanating from the U.S. government. I don't know if they're going to actually address this. I have doubts. But if they were genuinely interested in disinformation as a societal ill, then this seems like it would be right up their alley. But I have a feeling they're going to conveniently overlook it. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, it's uh, it, it's interesting because a lot of the media is basically, as I sort of alluded to earlier, just functioning as uh, organs for what what is overtly admitted to be a disinformation campaign. I actually read a piece on Min Press News by Dan Cohen, for, I think maybe two weeks ago, yeah. where he gets into this uh, in terms of what the Ukraine government is doing. I can for, pull it and up. It's, well, and it, and it, yeah, I was just going to say, and you know, when you you mentioned this whole issue of. Um, the genocide label being adopted. Well, arguably that originated, or at least that was popularized most decisively by Zelensky himself, because what did he do? Well, he's on this worldwide Zoom tour of all the parliaments he can possibly address or legislative bodies. And maybe his most brazen appearance was when he uh, went to the Israeli Knesset um, and essentially berated Israel for not doing enough to help Ukraine and to oppose Russia. And he did this in part by invoking the specter of the Holocaust. He said that what Russia is doing now is the latest iteration of a so-called final solution. Now, and to say that to the is, Israeli parliamentarians is kind of, that takes cojones, I think is the technical term. Um, and, uh, what, it, what happened in the aftermath of that? Well, uh, Zelensky's PR savvy has paid off. Genocide is now the standard term is used to describe events like what purportedly occurred in Bukha prior to any independent investigation whatsoever. I mean, India and China at this UN Security Council meeting this week had their diplomats say something that at least in a vacuum sounds rather sensible, which is that before we make any conclusions about these events, which do seem troubling, given that you know there are these images of people in body bags and mass graves and such, that warrants some investigation. So in order to render any conclusion, what ought to be done is that an independent investigation should be launched. Absolutely. And then once we can verify the facts, you know, may well have been Russia, but we don't know that for any for sure. I mean, no, no one does until there's an independent investigation, right? That's the whole point. Uh, but China and Russia and, uh, and India making this request is somehow regarded as an incredibly fringe and even despicable view in the so-called West, where unless you preemptively issue a formal denunciation that characterizes this as a deliberate genocide on the part of Russia, then you're an apologist for Putin. Right? That, that means you're, a, you're shilling for his genocidal regime, as I have been accused of doing, which, of course, is like total idiocy but that that's actually a it's an effective discursive tactic on the part of people who want to defend this consensus that well, is, we, is is fueling this proxy war effort well, and, and, we saw also, and thereby enriching by the way the military yeah. industrial complex and the think tanks that are funded by the military industrial complex well what i was just trying to say is that i mean absolutely and this is just the same like smear campaigns that we're seeing uh, when it comes to the war in Syria. I mean, Mint Press was heavily targeted as well in these kinds of attacks, calling us Assadists or spreading disinformation or whatever it is. A lot of our journalists did, you know, went through the same thing. And it just happens over and over again with whatever conflict that we see. But specifically with this crisis, I mean, this has been the most aggressive. And I think because of uh, NATO's uh, agenda in the region. Um, this yeah. article here is, um, you know, pointing to, you know, 
referring to as not far short of genocide, which is coming from a statement from Prime Minister um, Boris Johnson of the UK. And of course, Boris Johnson has become like the face of this crisis as well, just like Biden, because he's been, um, you know, he's been pushing for weapons there, promoting this uh, war against Russia. And even in the UK, they're, they've been calling for foreign fighters. I mean, people in the UK have joined the fight in um, in Ukraine to fight the Russians. So of Americans. I did a substat yeah. where I, I interviewed an American, essentially mercenary, um, who I happened can to you, just encounter. And, can you pull uh, up the link? Is it possible? Uh, yeah, I could pull up. If it's up. too much work, we don't need to, but I was going to say it would be nice to, to point. Okay. To uh, how do I, what, what should I do to pull it up? Should I share my screen? Yep. Um, hold on. Because I think this story about fighters leaving these Western countries to go fight on the battlefield here in U or battlefield in Ukraine is really interesting because we saw similar things happen in Libya and in Syria, except those people were um, considered jihadis, right? And those people were arrested and investigated, um, except now we're actually calling for uh, Westerners to go and fight in these wars. Yeah. Uh, sorry, it's bringing up all kind of uh, privacy preferences for me to okay. figure out how to allow it. Allow if it's this. Too much yeah, yeah. But basically, people can Google it pretty easily. March 16th headline is American foreign fighter says he was injured in Russian airstrikes. So essentially, what happened was I was at one of these processing centers on the Ukraine border in Poland for displaced people who have, you know, really had a harrowing experience where they're fleeing their homes and whatever in the midst of the war. And there's this guy in army fatigues walking around um, with a American flag patch and a Ukrainian flag patch on his shoulder. And of course my interest was yeah. me. So I talked to him and he said that he was at this so-called international peacekeeping facility in far Western Ukraine, Yavoriv, um, that had been targeted in a Russian airstrike. And the number of people killed in this airstrike is still not clear, even though it was several weeks ago now. Uh, but he was, you know, he was in his a, a barracks uh, at this base during the strike. And he said that he would have been killed because if he had been slightly differently positioned on his bed because the strike blew out his windows in his room. And he said that he would have been impaled, uh, not impaled, but he, a shard of glass would have struck him in the heart and killed him. And it was only by luck that he he avoided that. So this was, and, and he ended up being slightly injured kind of, uh, on his hand and arm and stuff, uh, not really that severe, but still, this was an American who was present at this facility because he's one of these people who have been lured into the country by Zelensky, who's openly who openly called for this influx of foreign fighters, and the U.S. media openly glamorizes these foreign fighters. CNN does these um, glowing profiles of american you know veterans who are entering ukraine i don't know if there are that many entering now but at the beginning of the war there were lots who were transiting into ukraine to fight with these so-called international legions or whatever the way this guy the, what the, this guy told me that he referred to it as the Zelensky battalion and that there were fighters from you know belgium and uh, canada and the uk and uh, yeah, this is sort of a, it's like an internationalization of the war that is reminiscent of what happened in Syria. Um, but I think the nature of the, the heroism of the, of the supposed cause here is a bit different in that it has, you know, given the outsized influence of Putin himself, like on American politics, like uh, in particular, there's this kind of clash of civilizations type feeling to it that seemingly entices certain enterprising, let's say, uh, potential fighters to travel and make the effort to come into these into this war zone. You know, I'm, I'm actually in London right now, and um, I was uh, driving around Oxford Street, which is this big uh, bustling area for high-end shopping and such. And at, in the nighttime, the trees along Oxford Street are lit up with uh, Christmas lights type, type things in the Ukrainian flag. Mm. Um, so you so you, you drive around and it's the blue and yellow lights uh, lighting up these these trees, which is sort of interesting. And then, you know, where I'm staying, I was just walking around recently and, 
you know, even like stuff like a vintage market has Ukraine flags flying. And the question that I always want to pose when I see these things is, okay, so what are you actually, what are the people flying these flags actually signifying support for? Because in practice, what it means to so-called stand with Ukraine is to support yeah. this proxy war, or it's to support the sanctions designed to, to collapse the Russian economy and to then engineer regime change, right? It's not just some generic statement of support for the plight of Ukrainians, which, you know, I think anybody who's humane would have a, a, a reason to do. I mean, I, I talked to a number of women, mostly, who had fled the war with their babies and such. And yeah, I mean, you can't help but sympathize with them. And a lot of them are just right. ordinary people who had nothing to do with any of this and are genuine victims because their lives have been upended by, you know, an, an aggressive bombing campaign by Russia that I, I think is is not defensible. Um, at the same time, you know, when you have Western powerhouse military countries like the U.S. and the U.K., which basically set the agenda, um, you know, just kind of innocently waving the flag of Ukraine, and that that is not that that coincides with a particular suite of policies that they're implementing. And so, when you say I stand with Ukraine, or that, or when you wave the flag. I, mean, I think more people who do that should be asked to clarify what exactly it is that they're supporting. I mean, do you support indefinite proxy warfare? Do you support the largest weapons trafficking operation basically since World War II in Europe? Do you support collapsing the Russian economy and inflicting suffering on Russian civilians in service of achieving regime change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, um, so... Uh, and there's the, I, I, because there's such an intractable consensus around this issue, it's not often that any clarification along those lines is even sought. I, would, I just shared my screen here just to go off your point of the way you made a point earlier about Zelensky being kind of made into this war hero, hero but he was also sexualized um, on Twitter and on TikTok. And a lot of women were going wild for Zelensky. <laughs> I miss this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know. I thought you would know about this. So Zelensky was... There was I'm always Googling thirst trap in Zelensky, so I don't know how I missed it. <laughs> so so the, he was very much uh, sexualized um, on social media, and he was made into like this hot, sexy war hero. Um, and and women were just going wild for him on TikTok, making videos, uh, you know, just talking about like their, how he is their biggest crush. And then I just want to show another one here really quick. Let me see where this one went. It's actually from the forward. I think I accidentally deleted out of it. Let's see if it's back here, which is fu a funnier headline. It's about, um, hold on, Zelensky being portrayed, yeah, as a sexy war hero, but how it's kind of getting weird. <laughs> yeah, Let's maybe a bit, a bit weird. Well, it's a little bit. Well, and the, the thing is, is that um, this was done, I believe, through the PR and disinformation kind of campaign people like the, the same groups that are pushing for this disinformation that are pushing the disinformation about what's really happening on the ground. These are the same people who are hypersexualizing Zelensky and the female soldier, the Ukrainian female soldiers um, as well. Just It's the same tactic that's used to hypersexualize, you know, Israeli female soldiers. Like, you know, look mm. at these hot women, but then look at the Palestinian women. They're oppressed, they're covered, and, you know, they're dark, and they don't, they can't speak for themselves. But look, you know, the, the Israeli female soldiers, they're, um, I found the link here. I just want yeah. to show, just because it's kind of funny, but <laughs> go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I think that early emphasis, uh, yeah, it's getting weird. Okay. <laughs> it is getting weird. <laughs> But, but yeah, I was going to say, I, I think I think that uh, the emphasis when the war first started on showcasing these women in Ukraine who were supposedly were taking up arms and who were posting photos of themselves on Instagram and everything. And people were really excited by these images um, and, you know, retweeting them to high heaven. Uh, I think part of that was kind of a savvy PR move on the part of uh Ukraine government officials, because what did it help do? It kind of connected Ukraine, the cause of Ukraine in this war to the cause of something like social justice in the US where, you know, it's like women's equality is now being promoted because women can 
fire sniper, sniper rifles or something in Ukraine, just like anyone else. I'm not sure how many women are actually taking up arms. Every time I see a report about casualties or something, it's men. I think it's just like a hand. So it seems to be like a handful of women who get uh, elevated in this way as sort of a PR attack. Um, but, you know, however many. According to the Washington Post, it's 32,000, which, you know, we don't know. We OK, really I mean, I know. guess possible. But uh, again, whenever yeah. I see video or images of, of casualties, it seems like it's, it's all men. But I mean, it's, it's sort of an irrelevant point. The, the idea behind the amplification of women supposedly on the front lines of this fight seems to me to be a clever way to make it in line with the sensibilities of like Western liberals who think that this war effort on in Ukraine is like on the cutting edge of something akin to social justice. But I think partly explains why you see such a fervor around it. I mean, it's, it seems like a lot of this is sort of the continuation of fervor that we saw. Um, it's like how they portrayed the YPG women. Uh, yeah, in the but but areas. but but even even like a, a people who were into even a lot of like a extremely diehard kind of officially institutionalized pro Black Lives Matter type activists, they're now just as enthusiastic about Ukraine as though there is this continu continuum between the two causes. And I think uh, the the Ukraine government officials cleverly picked up on that and have propagated information to kind of solidify that that effect in the minds of, of liberals, which is, I think, in part an explanation for why they're so incredibly passionate about this, despite many of them probably never have even even heard of Ukraine before February, or at least could you know, being I, able to locate it on a map. I want to share just one last week before we kind of wrap up here. I want to talk about a couple more things, but I think we don't I don't know if we're going to have enough time. Um, okay. Because I know that one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is uh, your meeting with some of these refugees and kind of how they support. You found out that they were actually supporting a no-fly zone, but perhaps they didn't truly understand what the yeah. ramifications of what a fly zone uh, or no-fly zone would be. Do you want to talk about that? And we can wrap up right after. Yeah. That. Well, the term that's been used by Zelensky and government and Ukraine government officials for a no-fly zone is sort of a euphemism on top of a euphemism because no-fly zone itself is a euphemism which obscures that this would be a u.s military intervention whereby direct hostilities would be undertaken between the u.s and russian warplanes right um but then they're also using now this second layer of euphemism in the form of close the sky like that's become it's become the slogan that Ukraine government officials and ordinary Ukrainians will use to kind of encapsulate their demand for a no-fly zone. And no and close the sky is kind of a benign sounding intervention. It, seems, it sounds almost like intrinsically humanitarian, right? Doesn't to the naked eye appear like it even entails in any military action at all. It's just like, oh, we're altruistically closing the sky to help everyone out, you know, whatever that means. And it seems like it was a very much a deliberate PR maneuver on the part of Ukraine government officials. In fact, when Zelensky addressed the U.S. Congress publicly over Zoom a few weeks ago, he played this gra very graphic and but well-produced video montage showing these, you know, disturbing scenes of carnage and uh, humanitarian and human, uh, you know, suffering in Ukraine. And, you know, it was overlaid with this dramatic sort of orchestral musical score and on and on and on. You know, Zelensky, as a figure, as a public figure, rose to prominence because he was a savvy television producer, essentially. Right. And he's continued that to much effect as president. Uh, but anyway, when he, pl he played this montage and then at, on the final kind of uh, screen, it said, close the sky. Basically enjoining the U.S. Congress to close the sky as a matter of policy in Ukraine, um, which is essentially a no-fly zone. So anyway, when I, when you talk to these displaced Ukrainian people, mostly women are the ones who I talk to because men are conscripted and not being permitted to leave. Actually, I spoke to one woman who said she visually observed a man attempting to leave Ukraine, uh, attempting to exit and being intercepted by the military and not and being forced to stay and fight. Right. Um, because, you know, martial law has been declared in, in Ukraine by Zelensky, 
who is also using his martial law powers to, for example, ban opposition parties and uh, other measures that aren't ordinarily associated with kind of virtuous liberal democracy. And yet, supposedly, this is the um, the existential battle for liberal democracy that's being waged that we, we, we all must support if we're right-minded citizens. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the women who I spoke to, um, when pressed, they would say, yeah, we support close the sky, close the sky, close the sky. Um, they're not like fervent about it or aggressive about it. They're kind of, you know, they have more things on their mind to worry about, such as caring for their children after having fled a war zone and, checking in on their husbands or brothers or fathers or whatever uh, who had to stay behind. Um, so their, their lives aren't consumed with the intricacies of the actual military tactical details of what a book close the sky would entail. And I think that was deliberate. That was purposeful on the part of people who, uh, the part of the people who in a PR with a PR logic invented this term uh, because close the sky to them and even uh, to some Poles who I spoke to, because if when I was, when you walk around different cities in Poland, for example, even places like coffee shops will have a placard hanging in their windows and close the sky in Ukraine. And I would ask the, you know, the barista or something or whoever put it up, just kind of, you know, innocuously, okay, so what, what are you saying you support here? And they really don't have any conception at all that this entails a military intervention on the part of the U.S. Right. It's just a generic statement of solidarity or sympathy with Ukrainians, which is understandable. But that's why it's so manipulative, right? Because they're equating general human uh, sympathy for people who have undergone real turmoil with support for this incredibly escalatory military action that would, if you believe Joe Biden, precipitate World War III. Because uh, that's the it reason that, that that's the that's the citation that's the reason he cites for not agreeing to this measure yet. Um, and that's yeah. absolutely what will happen. Yeah. So so I mean one 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 thing I tried to ponder in writing one of these articles recently was how to deal with people who are themselves victims, like these women who had fled and had to leave their homes and you know mm-hmm. carry their babies into a foreign country because of the trouble that they were leaving behind, uh, how to deal with it when they are espousing this viewpoint, which if if enacted, if acceded to, would wreak global destruction unlike anything any of us have ever experienced, right? So on the one hand, they are deserving of sympathy, but on the other, their policy prescriptions cannot be countenanced because it could result in nuclear annihilation, so Absolutely. it's kind of a it's kind of a confounding moral quandary to to sort of uh, parse and um, you know I the, the 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 sort of conclusion that I come to is basically these people who are themselves victims have been deliberately misinformed and have been and so therefore ought not to be demonized as like somehow warmongers but they should be re- it should be recognized that they have. A fallen victim in an additional sense in being told that the solution to their ills is to basically launch a global military conflagration that would just uh, exponentially increase the amount of suffering in the world. That's such a beautiful point that you made. I really appreciate you saying that. And I think it's really important that people do take that to heart to not dehumanize the people that are running away from a situation that they are so afraid of. It is a scary situation. You know, having myself lived under Israeli occupation and witnessed warplanes dropping bombs on houses in Ramallah, you're living in fear. You're living in anxiety. And that also distorts, uh, you know, your understanding and your critical thinking at times. And so a lot of these people who are, um, you know, running away from war, I mean, they're just they're just in survival mode. And the media, unfortunately, uses that to manipulate the masses and pushes that kind of agenda to push for a no fly zone, which obviously is could lead to further escalation with Russia and nuclear annihilation. And I just want to wrap up with this tweet that I tweeted yesterday. I just want to show it because we're seeing. Uh, kind of revision, revisionism when it comes to even Joe Biden and how he's portrayed as Uncle Joe, 
having a lot of gaffes. And it kind of goes back to our, our first point that we made. And he just really is asleep and he doesn't know what's really happening. And, you know, just poor Uncle Joe. When in reality, we're seeing like the third term of Obama's pre presidency taking place right now. He's wide awake. Joe Biden is wide awake, you guys. He's not sleepy Joe. Um, so I tweeted, Joe Biden called Putin a war criminal, yet Biden had no problem personally approving $735 million worth of missiles to Israel last May when it was bombing Gaza. I mean, we were covering this story pretty extensively at the time. And of course, Gaza is the world's largest open air prison where Israel uses U.S. made bombs by Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing to target homes, schools, hospitals and buildings housing journalists. Um, on Yemen, the world's worst humanitarian crisis where Saudi Arabia regularly bombs residential homes and schools and school buses carrying children, Biden personally, personally approved $650 million worth of air-to-air -air missiles um, to Saudi Arabia in his first term after vowing to end the war during his presidential campaign. And on Afghanistan, where the U.S. waged two decades of war and turned the country into a narco state, Biden personally approved the freezing of $7 billion worth, I spelled equit with, but it's worth, of the country's assets, while 23 million Afghanis face famine. And if people don't know, they should know that Afghanistan right now is on its way to becoming the world's worst humanitarian crisis up there with Yemen. Um, and we can't forget, of course, that Joe Biden was the vice president under Obama when their administration was arming jihadis in Syria and Libya, turning Libya into a failed state. Um, and working with the president himself, Obama, to drone strike weddings and funerals in Yemen. The hypocrisy that we're seeing right now is so real and so ridiculous. And it's, it's devastating because it's being used to um, it's being used to uh, manipulate people further. Yeah. So I just want to say, oh, go ahead. If you want yeah, to yeah. well, I mean, lest we forget. <laughs> OK, so yeah. in the 2020 Democratic primaries, I actually interviewed Joe Biden. OK. Okay. Granted briefly. <laughs> let's, let's talk about this. Granted briefly, but I did interview him um, because around the time, I don't know if you recall, but there was this mini controversy about Biden putting forth uh, a certain amount of revisionist history as to his role during the 2003 uh, invasion mm -hmm. of Iraq when he was the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and thus played an integral role in actually giving Bush bipartisan cover to launch the invasion. Um, so Biden voted for the war as the Hillary Clinton and John Kerry and most other prominent Democratic officials at the time. Right. Um, but fast forward, Biden's running for president again in uh, 2019, 2020. And he's kind of acting like he opposed the war somehow, even though he was one of the most critical players in actually enabling the initiation of it. Uh, so I, I, I was at this event he did in New Hampshire, um, and he reiterated to me that he he actually gave me a, a like he had just debuted a couple new rationalizations for what he did in 2003, but he debuted to me another one, and he said he actually opposed the war before it began because before he, he had previously been saying oh that, you know pretty soon afterwards he figured out that it was a bad idea and started opposing it to me he said he opposed it before it began. Right. And then so I know that was was struck a little bit curious. So I went and looked at the record. And, you know, on the night of the invasion. He's on CNN. Declaring his unflinching support for Bush. Right. Um, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, Biden is actually a very skillful politician. I mean, that's why he won the Democratic nomination in 2020 when he was written off by a lot of people, including leftists and progressives and such, who think, thought he didn't have a chance, either because he was cognitively hobbled or because he was too, quote unquote, centrist or whatever. Uh, no, he's actually, I thought he's, he's much more skillful than really Hillary Clinton was uh, in terms of managing the Democratic Party coalition and kind of put, situating himself at the median of the party. Um, and uh, in 2003, one of the things that he, one of his big accomplishments thus at that point thus far in his career was to help Bush give Bush ra rationale to uh, to launch launch the war, and he did that from his very influential perch as the chairman of this committee in the Senate. Um, so, you know, although he expressed remorse for that, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of indication that he ever thoroughly 
sort of repudiated the worldview that gave rise to him acquiescing to that invasion. And so I think today, when we see him in the midst of a formal speech that he's delivering in Warsaw, Poland, announcing his determination to impose regime change in Russia and, you know, oust Putin. Uh, yeah, I think he, he, that should be taken. We should take him at his word, right? And he's have, the president. Yeah, of he's the, the one who US makes the policy. I mean, sometimes I'll hear people tell me, oh, you know, but Biden said that, but it's not official U.S. policy. It's just like, okay, who do you think crafts U.S. foreign policy? I mean, yeah. the president has a massive amount of leeway, unfortunately, to unilaterally craft U.S. foreign policy. It's where they can basically bomb anywhere in the world whenever they want. Right. And they don't even have to really consult Congress. Um, so when the president says something, that's the reflection of policy. And actually, when you look at the actually the existing policy, such as the sanctions, such as the you know weapons funneling operations, such as the uh, diplomatic efforts to undercut some sort of negotiated resolution, all of it militates toward the conclusion that the U.S. is indeed, as Joe Biden said, aiming to impose regime change. I mean, there's, it's not really a secret. And yet we get all these kind of convoluted rationalizations yeah. and deflections uh, rather than just acknowledging what is a president uh, said. Is, is looking us squarely in the face. Michael, it has been truly an honor and a pleasure speaking with you. Um, I certainly learned so much from you and about your experience and your reporting. And I'm sure that everybody that was listening did as well. Um, I really appreciate everybody joining us today. This will also, this is obviously going to be available um, after the live stream is over on our YouTube channel and on Rockfin. And also we're going to make it into a podcast and upload it to our Spotify account. We really appreciate everybody for their super chats as well. And we will catch you guys next week on our next live stream. Actually, we're going to have a live stream tomorrow. I just remembered tomorrow. So we'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you so much, Michael. All right. Thanks. I enjoyed it.